The last few years have been a time of reckoning over the country's legacy of slavery and racial inequality. It is evident that in many places, local stories about these inequities have not been fully explored or perhaps have been swept under the rug. In any number of states and towns, including Wilton, Connecticut, there is still much to be learned from the documents and artifacts that provide evidence and proof of some painful episodes in our local past. Facts are needed to ground discussion and make more information available to the public, which is why we are here today. According to cthistory.org, a program of Connecticut humanities, slavery in Connecticut dates back as far as the mid 1600s. Connecticut's growing agricultural industry fostered slavery's expansion. And by the time of the American Revolution, Connecticut had the largest number of enslaved people in New England. In 1790, the first federal census showed that there were 3,763 people held in bondage throughout New England, and 2,648 of them lived in Connecticut. As you will learn today, there were many prominent families in Wilton whose households included enslaved Africans and enslaved indigenous people. Wilton Historical has an original document on display, essentially a sales receipt dated 1757, in which David Lambert of Wilton takes ownership of an enslaved African man named Jack. Labor, and plenty of it, was necessary to build wealth in early Wilton and every other nearby town. Enslaved men did farm work, built barns and barrels, shoed horses, dug stones, stacked walls, and worked in stores. Enslaved women cared for children, cleaned, cooked, made clothing, milked cows, and made medicine. Their captive labor was the foundation of affluence and wealth for many families in Wilton. William Lloyd Garrison, a prominent American Christian, abolitionist, journalist, suffragist, and social reformer called Connecticut the Georgia of the North as racism remained deeply entrenched long after slavery ended. As a matter of historic record and of equitable recognition, it is important to shine a light on the over 130 enslaved people who lived in Wilton between approximately 1720 and 1830. Most importantly, what were their names? Where did they come from? Where did they live? What were their lives like? Where are they buried? What family owned them? Who are their descendants and what are their stories? So many questions still remain. The research is not easy, but thanks to grant funding from the Elizabeth Raymond Ambler Trust, Wilton Historical, through the skilled research of historian Julie Hughes, has been able to add considerable data to the historic record. We hope this will inform expanded school curriculum and allow new museum interpretation, public education, and scholarship. And now for some background on our speaker, Julie E. Hughes. Julie Hughes earned her PhD in South Asian history from the University of Texas at Austin. She taught at Vassar College and Queens College and is the author of Animal Kingdoms, published by Harvard University Press. Since moving to the Wilton area, she has become interested in local history. Julie is now archivist at the Wilton History Room and worked on history projects with Wilton Historical, Ambler Farm, and the Gilbert and Bennett Cultural Center. Her most recent work for Wilton Historical was research for the 2020 online exhibition, Citizens at Last, Hannah Ambler, Grace Schenk, and The Vote, as well as her talk, Caring for the Vote, Mothers and Suffragists in Wilton, Connecticut. Some of you may know Julie through personal contact with her at the Wilton History Room, which is in the library on the second floor. If you follow Wilton Historical on social media, which I encourage you to do, uh, you may already be enjoying her history grams, marvelous nuggets of Wilton history, researched and written by Julie, which come out once a week on Facebook and Instagram. Whether you are a history geek or just love Wilton, you will love history grams. Like us on Facebook and Instagram to get the latest on great programs and events like this as well. Wilton Historical is also preparing a video which will utilize more of this grant research this time focused on some of Wilton's slave-owning families, such as the Lamberts. 
We hope to share that with you in a couple of months where it will be available 24 seven along with over a dozen History is Here videos created by associate curator Nick Foster and other program recordings. Just a reminder, please remain on mute and type in your questions at the chat at the bottom of the screen. There will be Q&A at the end. This talk is being recorded and will be available on the Wilton Historical website and on YouTube early next week, possibly even by tomorrow, but I can't guarantee. And now here's Julie Hughes, who will talk about enslaved Black residents and their descendants, five lives from Wilton past. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Allison. All right, let me just share my screen here because I have a PowerPoint for you. And just one moment, there we go. Okay, so uh, one of the first problems that you face when you're actually trying to do research into enslaved persons and those who are descended from the enslaved are the sources that you have to work with. Uh, there are myriad challenges and I wanted to talk to you about those a little bit first so that you have some idea of, of, the, of the difficulties of this process, but also the potential rewards. So how do you research 18th and 19th century black <laughs> lives? Um, some of the conveniences and complicating factors, there's both. One of the first is that black names are often not given in the sources at all. And if I can get this to move to the next image, there's just some of the places that I get. Okay, so this is a newspaper article, uh, a newspaper uh, uh, advertisement from John Cannon selling to uh, slaves, a, a Negro woman and boy, uh, an enslaved woman and boy, and uh, he doesn't give the names at all. So a lot of times we'll find some information, but it's not going to be the information that we want necessarily, but it's going to be all that we have to work with because that's all that the people at the time bothered to record. Often uh, when you're looking through the sources, you might get a 500 page volume, a huge chunk of information that maybe is part of a 20 volume set, and at some point, some wonderful person has gone through and provided an index. In that index, almost without exception, black names, slave sales, and emancipations are not included in those indexes. So if you want to find these people, if you want to find the enslaved or the formerly enslaved, you have to go through every single page of every single volume to pull them out of those records because the indexes are not extant to make your life easier or to commemorate those people's lives. In addition, town recorders, the people who were meant to record information in a lot of these sources, which are official uh, town and government sources like land records, like probate records, they didn't always record the information they were legally required to record. For instance, after 1784, any enslaved person who was born after a specific date in March 1784, by law in Connecticut, they were to become free when they hit the age of 25. It is extremely common, it seems, for birth dates of people born right around March 1784 to not be recorded. If you don't record it, maybe you can get a few more years of labor out of this person. If you don't record it, maybe you can pass this person off as born before that date and you never have to free them. So there are motivations for a lack of information, even if it's information that legally was supposed to be recorded. Moving on to something like, actually this one is, I should have moved this, this sign because the highlighted portion is uh, from one of these places where somebody followed the law and recorded the births of Jed, Chloe and Amos. And you can see their birth dates there. And you can see that the person doing the recording, Thaddeus Betts, who was a Norwalk and Wilton resident, he specifically said that it, this was because of the inaction of the law for the freeing of, uh, it's hidden by the little sidebar, but it says of, of black, well, it says Negro slaves at 25 years of age. So he's following the law, but not everyone did. Moving to probate records, when somebody dies, 
one of the things that was recorded were their wills, but also a detailed inventory list of everything they owned. This is a wonderful place of, actually it's a very disturbing place, but it's a wonderful resource for trying to find records of enslaved persons. As you can see on the highlighted portion here, once again, you don't always get names. You get very uncomfortable details like how much they were valued at. But the worst thing about them from the perspective of the researcher is that in these extremely long and detailed inventories, there is no predictable location within the inventory to find those records of enslaved persons. Sometimes they are grouped in with the livestock, not comfortable, but true. Sometimes that's where they are. Sometimes they're with the kitchen implements. Sometimes they're with the land holdings. Sometimes they're with the bedding. There is no predictable place. And uh, I think that that does reflect some uncertainty on the parts of the slaveholders themselves as to exactly where to put these people uh, who are you know, uh, in their ownership yet clearly somehow different than everything else that they own. One of the handy things about these earlier records is that uh, you do tend to have consistent identification of individuals by race in a lot of the resources that you have to look through. So uh, this does not apply, unfortunately, to military records, like this military record from a pension application of Cato Treadwell. It never identifies him by race. But that's one way that you can find people because those earlier recorders were so invested in making sure that it was not forgotten, not unknown, what the race of somebody was. Another factor that makes it easier in some cases to pick out a enslaved person or a descendant from enslaved persons is that particularly in the earlier records in the 1700s, the names tend to be pretty distinct. And these are names that will sometimes be given by the slave owner. Sometimes they will have West African origins uh, and those names, for instance, in the early period from Wilton's own history, we have Pompey Caesar. The Roman theme was a big naming trend among the enslavers. There's Cuffy, which is coming from an African name for, I believe it's Friday or Saturday. It's a day of the week commemorating what day that person was born. There's Gin, which is probably short for Guinea, West Guinea or New Guinea, excuse me, not New Guinea, the Guinea coast. And then there's Cato Treadwell here. Once again, that Roman trend with Cato in the name. Later names tended to be less distinct. So as time goes on, it becomes harder to pick out black names from the majority of white names surrounding them. Some names from later periods in Wilton's history are Jack Botsford and Harry Marvin. With them, the only clues in their names are those diminutives that it's Jack instead of John and Harry instead of Harold. Then there's Eunice Belden. There's absolutely no hint in her name that she is black. You have to find out from surrounding circumstances, from looking at a wide variety of sources and finding one place where she is referred to by her race uh, to then identify that she is black. Finally, a final difficulty, um, though it is a very uh, revealing and interesting difficulty is that amongst uh, descendants from uh, African slaves, enslaved persons, there was a, a cultural trend where your name after a significant life event, you might change your name. Very often this happens from an enslaved period to a period of freedom. So you have a slave name and then you have a free name. This happened in Wilton with Lazarus. Lazarus became John C. Wally. You also have it uh, at times after the enslaved period. Another example from Wilton's history is Phyllis Manning Treadwell. That is her initial name. Later in life, she goes by Eliza Mead. So all of these uh, challenges and as I've turned them conveniences come together to make it uh, quite an undertaking to do this sort of research, but it is very rewarding and very necessary research.
Now getting to the actual five lives that I wanted to discuss today. Uh, the first one is Phyllis Abbott. She is also known as Gin. And as I mentioned with that name, it probably is a diminutive coming from uh, the Guinea coast, the west coast of Africa, uh, where many of these uh, enslaved persons were brought in from. And indeed, we have a 19th century story about Phyllis that says she was imported directly from Africa, that she was African born. And that tells us it gives us a clue about when she was born because we have almost no factual on the table on in the documents information about Phyllis. Um, this is where um, her family lived later in life. This is what I'm trying to get to. This record is about her. She was enslaved, as you can tell from this record, by the family of Ebenezer Abbott. His wife was Hester Middlebrook Abbott, so she is equally complicit. They lived between the 1740s and the early 1820s, and amongst their several slaves was Phyllis, here referred to as Gin. We know from this record that she was having children in the mid to late 1780s, and that gives us an estimate of her age range. If these were her first children, which they weren't necessarily, but if these were her first children, perhaps she was born in the 1760 to 1770 range, that fits with the legal situation. If she was indeed imported directly from Africa into this country, specifically into Connecticut, it had to occur legally before 1774. In 1774, you had the act for prohibiting the importation of Indian, Negro, or mulatto slaves. So legally, she could not have been imported into Connecticut after that date. Most likely she was born before 1774. We have no idea when she died. Aside from this record, and most likely this census record, which shows Ebenezer Betts on the left in the upper block, it's hidden by the sidebar, at least on my screen, but it goes over there and shows in the very last column that at this date, this was the 1800 census, that he had one slave one enslaved person, and that he had two free Blacks living in his household. Probably some combination of Phyllis and her children. That's it. We have no other documentary evidence about Phyllis. We do have these late 19th century stories about her, anecdotes, and they come ultimately from somebody who was descended from the Abbott family. One of those is her origin story, that she comes from Africa. Another is, and I will quote the source, that Phyllis was very proud of her color. When going to a dance, she would grease her face to make it shine. Why did this fact, and big quotation marks around fact, why did this supposed fact about Phyllis stick in local memory? I would argue that it plays into the conceits of how Connecticut slavery has been remembered locally, not just in Wilton, but throughout Connecticut. One of the main aspects of that is that slavery has been remembered as something that was ultimately of benefit to Blacks. It was in fact done for their benefit. This is clearly something that I am not arguing in favor of. I do not agree with this. This is what I would argue historically has been the way slavery has been explained in Connecticut. The argument goes on to say that slaves were happy. They were ignorant, childish, misguided and needed white oversight. When you think back to this anecdote, we are asked to find it amusing. We are supposed to be laughing at Phyllis because she is so misguided and so wrong as to think that her dark, luminous skin was beautiful. That's supposed to be funny. We are supposed to find that misguided. And of course, the correct answer is that white skin 
is beautiful, not her skin. She needs guidance. And this is just a small misunderstanding of hers that stands in for a larger state of needing guidance. Another myth about Connecticut slavery that this anecdote is arguably asking us to embrace is that slaves were treated like family in Connecticut. This is a major myth about Connecticut slavery as opposed to say slavery in the South. Slaves here were subjected to a kinder and gentler version of slavery. They were part of the family. Now this is not an argument that we can dismiss out of hand because former Connecticut slaves, many of them have recorded you know, snippets of information that refer to themselves as being born in the family of their enslaver, themselves using that language of kinship. But it's an almost but not quite situation. You're almost family, but not quite. You never quite make it. And in this anecdote, the amused affection that we are meant to kind of feel towards Phyllis. It's not a condemnatory thing. We aren't meant to dismiss her out of hand. It has an air of amused affection. We're laughing at someone that we love. And that is uh, the message of that particular uh, source. So with Phyllis, she really tells us that we've got a paucity of original hard facts. Those hard facts don't tell us everything we want to know about her. And then on top of it, we have these very problematic 19th century anecdotes, which perhaps can tell us something firm, but mostly what they're able to tell us is about 19th century opinions and arguments about what slavery in Connecticut was. Now, if this anecdote can tell us anything actually about Phyllis, one thing it suggests, one question it raises that it cannot ultimately answer, was there a society of the enslaved in Wilton? Were they going to dances? Is that real? It's entirely possible that it was. We know from other sources left by former enslaved persons that there were dances, there were societies, there were entertainments that enslaved persons had. And if Wilton had enough enslaved people to support something like that, that's quite different from the stories that we've maybe been led to believe are true of a rural Connecticut town. There were enough enslaved people here potentially that they were having dances, that they had society, that they had community. Another thing that this anecdote might actually be able to tell us, something it suggests, another question it raises, did African values persist among the enslaved? This anecdote tells us that Phyllis thought her dark skin was beautiful. That is not something she learned here in Connecticut. If she learned that someplace, it was in Africa and she held on to it. That is an example, if this is true, of resilience on her part. And that is something that arguably she passed down onto her descendants, one of whom is the next person I would like to discuss, her granddaughter, Jane Manning James. Uh, Jane, uh, just so you can see there, that's where the family home was. They owned it. It is no longer standing, but it was on Sharp Hill, excuse me, on Old Highway, about 96 Old Highway. That's Jane. Jane lived approximately from 1820 to 1908. Some sources give us 1813 as her birth date, but uh, I tend to go with 1820. Her significance for us today is that unlike her grandmother, she speaks in her own voice. We have her own autobiographical statements and descriptions of her own life. In those, she narrates her struggles for spiritual fulfillment and equality, even arguably superiority as a free black woman of faith and specifically of the Mormon faith. Now she was born free. She was never enslaved and she was actually quite sensitive about being mistaken for having been enslaved, uh, for being enslaved in the moment or for having ever been enslaved. She did not want people to think that of her because uh, prejudices at the time assumed that if you had been subjected to a servile condition that it ontologically changed you. It made you inferior, it made you lesser. Your experiences, your environment changed 
your qualities as a human being. So having been enslaved would mean that you were lesser. Having never been enslaved meant you were something much closer to equal with everyone else. When she was about 14, Phyllis, uh, excuse me, Jane was living in New Canaan working as a domestic servant. At that time, she attended the sermons of a traveling preacher of the Mormon church. He was an elder in the Mormon church. His name was Charles Wesley Wandell. He's the one in color here. And this is about 1842. His sermons inspired Jane to become baptized in the Mormon religion. And uh, it also, we're not certain if her family members went to his sermons in person or if Jane was the cause of their conversion, but a number of her family convert and a number of other Black Wiltonians convert. And ultimately they go to Nauvoo, Illinois in 1843 and 1844, which is where the early Mormons were uh, camped out at that moment where Joseph Smith, the founder of the religion was at that time. And Joseph is the fellow in black and white. In the early Mormon church, and this is not surprising considering that all of society was rather problematic at this time, but Jane does run into both gendered and racial prejudice in the early Mormon church. In particular, this is going to be associated and where it's going to bother her most is where it's associated with ritual participation. She is limited because of her gender and because of her race to regular worship and what's called proxy baptisms. Proxy baptisms are where you are baptizing the dead who are you know, your relatives, who are your close friends, and you would like to give them the opportunity to join you in the afterlife to become Mormon after the fact. So she's able to do that with uh, special permission at times. Now the scholar Quincy Newell has said that also without quote, temple endowments and ceilings, Jane's family would not be together after death and they would not be able to attain the highest degrees of glory in the afterlife. So she is also partially because of her gender, some of this would need to be done by her husband and partially because of her race, she is not allowed to have temple endowments and ceilings, thus her family won't be together, thus she can't attain highest status. At the same time as she faces these various prejudices within the church, she also has significant privileges one of those, and these are ones that she argues for herself, that she says, these are privileges that I have been shown. These are blessings that I have received and they should translate into me getting temple endowments and ceilings. They should translate into me getting equal treatment. She argues in her autobiographical statements that she experienced visions of Joseph Smith as a prophet before she ever saw him in person. She saw him in a vision and recognized him as a prophet. She spoke in tongues it came upon her and she spoke in tongues. Faith healing, on two occasions early in her history as a Mormon, she engages in faith healing. In one case where elders of the church had failed, she and her family succeed. This demonstrates that she is blessed, that her family is blessed, that they are perhaps even superior in this moment, in this instance, over established church elders who are put in that position by church um, organization rather than perhaps by the quality of their faith. Another thing that demonstrates in Jane's own words her privilege within uh, the Mormon church, within Mormonism, is that once she arrives in Novu, uh, she actually arrives completely destitute. Uh, our lovely uh, Charles Wesley Wandell, he had been entrusted with her luggage uh, because they had been forced to split at one point and Charles lost all of her luggage, all of her worldly belongings. She and her family had nothing when they arrived in Novu. They went from being homeowners in Wilton to having literally nothing except the clothes on their own backs. Jane is actually brought into the household of Joseph Smith, the founder, and she works as a domestic servant in his household. In that capacity, she is allowed to handle seer stones that were used to receive and translate revelations. She's allowed to care for Smith's secret ritual garments. And she's even invited into his family as an adoptee. All of these pieces of evidence, Jane brings forward in a lifelong campaign with church leadership to get those temple endowments and ceilings. 
the refrain that she continues with is this quote, is there no blessing for me? She continually argues for it. And in the end, she does achieve a compromise. She doesn't get quite what she wanted, but she gets a lot more than they were initially going to give her. And that is this compromise that she is sealed to Joseph Smith, not as his adopted daughter, as she argued she had been offered, but as his servant. So she, uh, nowadays, Jane really has the status within uh, the church that I believe she was campaigning for. Uh, she did not achieve it in her lifetime, but uh, arguably nowadays she has it. The next person that I wanted to talk about is Charles D. King. He's associated with the, oh, there's Jane, by the way, again, on the lower left, that's her brother, Isaac. So Charles D. King, associated with the Lambert family, his significance for us today, he helps illustrate the ambiguity of enslaved versus free and being part of the family versus being a servant. Also, he gives some insight in black struggles for social and community status in antebellum Connecticut. He lived in the household of Samuel F. Lambert and Samuel's siblings. They all lived from approximately the 1780s to the mid 1800s. We don't honestly know if Charles was enslaved or not. He was allegedly the, born the son of a free woman, in which case he ought to have been born free himself. But we also have the story that he was given, specifically given to either sibling Julia or Elizabeth as a child. We do know by 1840, he definitely was not enslaved. He's in Samuel Lambert's ledger, receiving pay for labor. We have evidence from uh, Charles's son, John James, that he accompanied Samuel to Europe on numerous occasions as Samuel's valet. So all of this is leaving it unclear, certainly by the end, he is not enslaved, but did he start out enslaved or not? It's unclear. He's certainly doing similar work. He has similar intimacy with the family. As for whether he's viewed as part of the family or not, thinking back to that argument that the 19th century sources have that Connecticut slavery was like family. Elizabeth actually left him a bequest in her 1837 will. This is extremely unusual. I've only found about four cases of similar bequests in Fairfield County. It's not a massive bequest. It's not a lot of money or anything. It's some clothing and it's some livestock, but it is coming without strings attached, which is also unusual. Normally there's a good behavior clause added. This one, he only has to reach the age of 21 and he gets these things free and clear. Another thing that kind of confuses the issue of is he part of the family or not, is he enslaved or not, is the question of where exactly Charles lived. This is a schematic of the upstairs story of the Lambert house. And the lower portion on the left here, lower left, is the back portion of the house, one of the back wings that was added. Um, that one was either late 1700s or early 1800s. I think that was the late 1700s wing. It's possible that Charles may at some point, particularly in his younger years before he marries, that he may have lived in this portion of the house. He may even have slept in the bedroom of Julia or Elizabeth, because once again, one of our 19th century rather gossipy stories alleges that as a child, he slept in the bed of either Elizabeth or Julia, who would have been anything from 20 to 30 years his senior. That is definitely blurring the lines between family or not family. It's also blurring potentially other lines, but we won't get into that. Um, in addition, on the issue of housing, Samuel Lambert allegedly, and this is according to Charles's son, allegedly built a house for Charles on the Westport Road. There's a possibility that this could be what is now termed the overseer's cottage. So we have Lambert house on the right here, and then on the far left, we have the overseer's cottage. This is an aerial view of those same two structures this time with the Overseer's Cottage in its original location from 1965. So it's possible 
that property, that house was for Charles. It's also possible another property on Westport Road, the Lamberts were extensive landowners, could have been the site of such a house. However, we also know from Samuel's ledger that in the 1840s, Samuel rented a house to Charles. Charles was paying rent. So perhaps this giving of a house is the provi providing of a house that will then be rented. It's unclear exactly what that relationship was, other than that certainly from the records, it seems ambiguous. It's an almost but not quite situation. He's almost family, but not quite. He's almost a slave, but not quite. Very transitional and exactly the sort of confusion that Jane was very determined to avoid in her own life. Now we also have the question of how did Charles view his own life, his own status. Interestingly, one of his children, the one we definitely know about, John James King, who goes on to be a Civil War veteran, he was named after John James Lambert. He was named after one of Samuel's siblings. Another child who I suspect but cannot prove without a doubt is Julia King, probably named after Julia Lambert. So we have Charles choosing names that incorporate him into the family. We also have some very interesting things about Charles's status, uh, not so much within the family, but within the community. One of the purchases that he makes is of 12 poplar trees. That's this tall skinny tree here in the front and this painting by Francis Sky showing Brooklyn in the summer about 1813 or so. Um, this is not a very practical tree. This is an ornamental tree more than anything else. If they get big enough, they can have some economic uses but Charles is probably buying these trees to plant them around his rented property to lend an aura of respectability perhaps, some sort of upper trajectory aspirational uh, things going on with Charles there that are very intriguing. Uh, just a bonus Charles Wilson Peel uh, painting, just showing you how popular this shape of tree was right around the 1815 to 1820 mark, uh, right when Charles is, is a young man, well, uh, soon after he's born actually. So our next person uh, to discuss is Susan Jackson Dulliman. She's a similar generation as our last two, Jane and Charles. She was born about 1820. She died sometime after 1898. Her significance for us today, and you can see she had a couple different places that we know she lived in Wilton over the years. Uh, her significance for us, as the 19th century progressed, cultural deviations from white upper and middle class norms were effectively criminalized for black people. Popular opinion increasingly saw blacks as innately, as opposed to environmentally inferior, immoral, and a burden on white society. So nature versus nurture debate, people are moving from nurture, from environmental influences causing these things to nature, it is innate. Black people cannot change, they cannot improve, they simply are inferior. Susan was the widow of Civil War veteran, Henry Dulliman, who died in Beaumont, South Carolina, 1864. This is his regiment here. He was part of the 29th. As a war widow, Susan applies for and initially receives a pension. She has a lot of trouble trying to do this because her name, her marriage date, her children's birth dates were all inconsistently remembered by her and recorded by others. No two sources agreed on any of these facts and she needed all of them to be authenticated in order to get that pension. This is a conflict between her culture, her community at that time where so many people who had come out of slavery were not aware of, were not accustomed to keeping track of dates, not the year portion at least, they would keep track of the day portion perhaps, but not the year. They perhaps were not literate, many of them, you can see that Susan has a little difficulty signing her own name. That is her signature there. She knows how to do it, but it's sort of approximate. Um, and that is reflected in the fact that her name is never recorded the same way. 
The way it is most often given now is Dullivan, and that is because that is the way it gets standardized for her pension application. That is the way it was in some of the official places it was recorded. Uh, if you go to earlier Wilton records, presumably people who knew her better, who knew her family better, Dullaman, Delaman, something like that is the more common way it's rendered. And that's why I've gone with Dullaman for her. Now, Susan, uh, the biggest problem Susan runs into is that there is a wide assumption by the 1880s and 1890s, you know, 20 odd years after she's been receiving this pension, that Black war widows are trying to defraud the government. They are not deserving. They are innately inferior. Obviously, they can't be deserving to receive these pensions anymore. And she has always been told, everyone has already always been told that if she remarries, she loses the pension. She knows that. However, in 1882, Congress introduces an open and notorious adulterous cohabitation clause. This says that if you are doing that, if you are engaging in open and notorious adulteration, adulterous cohabitation, that you can also lose your pension. A pension examiner comes around and researches Susan. He finds from neighbors that they call her Mrs. George Holmes. She has a boarder named George Holmes. He's there occasionally, not consistently. He's a sailor and they allege that she has had, quote, connection with him. This is Victorian euphemism. This is in Bridgeport where she's living at the time. In her own words, when she's defending herself after her pension has been revoked, I was questioned by a man sometime since who represented himself to be a pension examiner. And I was so embarrassed and flustered by his manner and language that I was unable to understand what I had sworn to. What she swore to was that she had slept with George Holmes, that he occasionally paid rent to her for his staying at her household. The way she describes the incident that they slept, it could easily have been a rape. It's really unclear. Um, on the strength of that, she loses her pension because I would argue largely because of prejudices that frame her actions as clearly the actions of someone innately inferior. The last person to talk about today is Charlotte. She went by Lottie, Charlotte Lottie Gilmore. She lived from 1853 to 1939. Her significance for us, even after this nature versus nurture debate has swung decisively towards nature, towards innate difference, a few individuals manage to achieve a sort of independence and attain membership in their local community in ways that weren't wholly determined by their race. Charlotte Gilmore was one. I would say Jane Manning James was another, uh, but Charlotte was also one. Charlotte's successes may seem small, but they must have been a source of pride to her and they ought to inspire our admiration as well as our anger and sorrow at how easily her successes were stripped away in the end. Charlotte first appears in Wilton in the 1870s. She was probably born closer to Hartford. Uh, her parents, when uh, probably before her birth, had been enslaved. She uh, reports this to someone later on that her parents had been enslaved. And uh, she appears in Wilton in the Georgetown area in the 1870s through the 1890s, working for the Charles and Elizabeth Olmsted family. By the early 1900s and through the 1920s, at least she is working as uh, out of her own home independently as a washerwoman. She's running her own business. She doesn't have to work in someone else's home. She can stay at home and do work on her own terms. In 1906, she became a multiple first in Wilton. She purchased 113 Portland Avenue, the house at that location. It no longer stands. In doing so, she became the first solo black woman homeowner in Wilton's history. We have some earlier ones who owned land in concert with one another. Jane and her siblings, her mother and her father-in-law owned property together but Charlotte is the first to do it on her own. 
She is also the first black homeowner in Wilton in the 20th century. In fact, the first after almost 100 years. Well, excuse me, 60 years. What's really interesting about Charlotte's experience is that this neighborhood that she purchased a home in, Portland Avenue, this is after Portland Avenue takes a 90 degree turn to the north and runs parallel to the train tracks. At that portion of Portland Avenue in the early 1900s, this was very much an immigrant neighborhood at the time. A lot of Italian American families, some Scandinavian, uh, but a lot of Italian American brought in to work at or be associated with the G&B mill. One of her neighbors in particular was an Italian American family that approached her seemingly very much on an equal playing field with a lot of sympathy. And of course, as a uh, discriminated against group themselves, Italian American families, you can kind of expect things to go towards one of two extremes, deep sympathy with another group that is also um, having a lot of bias against them, or perhaps a more defensive posture where you're trying desperately to maintain difference between yourself and the next person down on the rung so that you are not confused with them. This family went the route of sympathy, of helping Charlotte and becoming close to her. One of a son from that family, he was quite young at the time, he's still alive and he remembers Charlotte. His mother sent him with vegetables from their garden to give to Charlotte. He would help Charlotte by carrying coal and wood deliveries from the delivery site at the top of this little hill that the house was on down some stone steps, which still remain into the house. And in return, Charlotte would give him gingerbread cake and store cheese. Store cheese is cut from a big, huge block. Charlotte's was a cheddar variety. And apparently the gingerbread cake was the best this guy has ever had in his life. No one has ever been able to beat it. On a less pleasant note, Charlotte's life uh, winding down in the 30s uh, becomes more difficult as she ages. She has no remaining family. She only has the help of neighbors. The town actually sues Lottie in 1937 for $1,500. They had provided her with some welfare support, purchasing food, clothing, and a stove. They find out belatedly that she is a property owner and they say, you are not destitute after all. We're going to sue you to take possession of the house. They succeed in that. The house is taken possession of. Lottie is put in care in Norwalk and she is later transferred to the Connecticut State Hospital in Middletown, which was an institution for the insane. Uh, perhaps she was suffering from age-related dementia, something like that. She is buried there in Middletown in grave 1296. Her house was then demolished, sold to the highest bidder. So just a couple conclusions here. Um, there's Lottie's, uh, her um, death notice, which was published in the Welton Bulletin. Uh, a couple conclusions. Black lives are to a great extent hidden in the records, but information can be found you just have to put in a lot of effort and be a little creative about where you're looking. Another thing to note is that popular opinion shifted over the course of the 1700s and 1800s from largely environmental to essentialist explanations for black difference. And as a final note, I would say that arguably we are in the midst of another transition or not, only time will tell, where we may be moving away from both environmentalist and biologically essentialist explanations for black difference or supposed black difference to explanations that are rooted more in pervasive structural forces that are operating in the present in concert with long-term after effects of slavery and other past abuses and prejudices. That's what I've got. Let me unsave my screen. Okay, you have the, any questions? 
Julie, I am going to yep. encourage everyone to type a question in the chat if they have one. As of now, I think everybody's been so enthralled by all of this information that they haven't <laughs> been able to tear themselves away from the screen to type. Um, so if anyone does have questions, please um, type them in now. Ooh, how much of it? Oh, well, you, why Kim, you, you're, you're in charge here. Well, no, <laughs> but I can answer that one. Many, why don't you just um, field it as you see it? Sure. Okay. So um, how much of it's in the history room? I would say about maybe 25% to a third is. Uh, another third maybe is online. And I can find that through uh, family search uh, dot uh, dot org particularly uh, through the history room now because it's a family search affiliate so we get extra information and then another third or so uh, like the information about the court case against Lottie that came from the state archives oh yes remember to read the questions so they don't show up that was the question of where did this stuff come from how did I choose the people to research I chose absolutely everyone that I could find. I followed down every single individual that I could and found as much information as I could on them. I only stopped when the information ran dry and I didn't think I could find anything more about that individual. So <clears throat> one of the things I produced was about a 75 page long document that is pure straight up biography of absolutely everyone I could find who had been enslaved in Wilton, who was a descendant of people who were enslaved in Wilton or who had been enslaved by someone with very close connections to Wilton, for instance, worshiping in a Wilton church, um, having land that they owned in Wilton, thus the enslaved person in some fashion was contributing to the development of Wilton. Okay, that one's kind of a, a I can answer that question later. That one was a little parochial. Um, Kim or Allison might ask, answer this question better. Uh, what kind of steps are underway to share this information to students in the Wilton schools? I think that's a very important uh, one to, to potentially discuss. Um, um, I can Kim tell you that we, um, we contacted the high school and they are very interested in having their students in the history classes, US history classes, um, watch this recording after they couldn't really assign it for today, but they're going mm -hmm. to show it next week. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they said they were very interested in it. And, um, you know, we're trying to make inroads into the high school uh, little by little. It's been a tough few years. They really mm -hmm. are trying to get a lot done, yeah. as we know. But one thing that we do know is that the Connecticut uh, Department of Education has approved a high school elective for um, that's on uh, African American and Latin history. Um, I, I've, the actual name of it escapes me right now. I should remember it, but I do not. Um, so we are trying. It's, it's an uphill battle sometimes uh, to break through the moat of the school, <laughs> but um, I think we've got their attention now. So hopefully this is the beginning of something Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Besides Lottie, are the graves of any of these people known to exist in Wilton or surrounding areas? The answer to that is definitely yes. Uh, the majority that we know of are at St. Matthew's uh, in their cemetery. And um, Charles King is there. He was a member of that uh, congregation. And um, his son, John James, is not there. Uh, he's out in somewhere in Norwalk, I believe. Uh, he dies in a, in a uh, soldier's home, Fitch's soldier's home, and it's someplace in the Norwalk area. Susan Jackson Dulliman might be at St. Matthew's. She does have a shared headstone there with her husband, Henry. Henry is not physically there. He's down in South Carolina, but he has a headstone at St. Matthew's. And from what I understand, I haven't looked at it personally, from what I understand, Susan's name is on it as well but she would have died in either Bridgeport or uh, possibly New Haven, where I believe her, uh, one of her sons was living. And um, it's, 
she probably didn't have a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of money to go around. So the logistics of getting her physically back here for internment, I'm a little doubtful it happened, uh, but it's, it's possible that it happened. It's entirely possible. Um, as for another question here, were enslaved people able to be part of congregations? Are there records of baptisms, weddings, and burials? Yes, yes. Uh, in the earlier time periods, we don't have a lot of records of that, particularly out of the congregational church. Uh, and some of that is down to the whims of the particular people who were keeping records. Some people, we have decades going by where nobody is getting the baptisms recorded particularly. Other times we'll have a particular uh, clergyman come in who's very good about recording these things. So it goes in fits and starts, um, but we don't have as many as I suspect were here. And that's a fairly common suspicion that we do not, scholars do not think that the amount of records, the people we can actually document accurately represents the number of people who were involved in um, slavery in Connecticut. We think it's a vast underestimation. And let's see what else have we got here. Have I been able to speak to any descendants? No, I have not, but um, I have been planning to reach out to the scholar Quincy Newell because she has been in contact with descendants of Jane Manning. Now, while Jane Manning is very much embraced within the Mormon community, there is some um, discomfort around her at times uh, from some people in the black community and some black scholars. She is seen, uh, she is seen by some uh, and Quincy Newell argues against the stance actually. She is seen by some as someone who joined an organization, a religion that was deliberately keeping her suppressed even more so perhaps uh, than the surrounding non-Mormon communities. Uh, that she is someone who compromised, that she uh, is, is not somebody to be celebrated because of that. And you know, I see her as someone along the lines of, of Quincy Newell's argument as someone who followed her faith and tried to improve it from within, tried to make changes in the structure, not necessarily in the beliefs of Mormonism, but in the structure of the church to better reflect what she thought uh, the religion should be and the practice of the religion should be. So I think that she made major contributions, but that's, I can see the other argument uh, quite clearly, and I, I can see why not everyone would want to. And apparently some of her descendants are a bit uncomfortable uh, with her uh, because of those, those reasons. But it would be interesting to contact them because, for instance, we now know where in Wilton she lived. We have uh, the address essentially of her, her home. They may be interested in knowing that. That's not been published yet. Nobody knows about that except us now. You can go and visit it, walk, uh, drive by and just wave at Jane as you go by. Uh, ooh, does Wilton have any black cemeteries where black residents are buried? We have plenty of rumors about them. And um, I might know where one is, but we have not proven it. Uh, so I won't say much more on that, but there is supposed to be one called Spruce Bank. Um, we may, we're working on it. It could be nothing comes of it, uh, but we're hoping maybe, maybe to find that one. Uh, we do know that a number of black folk are buried at St. Matthew's. Uh, there are some who are buried at uh, the Congregational Church uh, Cemetery as well. So uh, they are here. And as for the total number of enslaved uh, being undercounted, um, there are probably far more black folk buried in Wilton than we know about. Uh, very often, you know, your, your gravestone might have been a field stone. Um, you might not have had a formally carved headstone or anything to, to last through the years, or as black folk left the area and they very largely did so by around 1860, the population of black folk who were born in Wilton and lived their lives here plummets. And instead what you see are people who are coming in as domestic labor. Um, by the time you hit about 1900, that domestic labor is actually coming up from the South. 
coming up as summer labor or as summer cooks and things like that, and then they're leaving. Mm-hmm. So those uh, permanent black cemetery locations <clears throat> fall into neglect and uh, get forgotten about entirely. This has happened with white cemeteries in Wilton as well. There is a, a lovely, lovely macabre story about how a bridge was being built on Wolf Pit Road near the train tracks. And they ended up digging up something like 10 skeletons that are probably associated with the very first location of the Congregational Church in Wilton. So uh, these things do get forgotten. Let's see here. Do I know anything about the generation between uh, Gin, uh, Phyllis, uh, Abbott, and Jane? Yes, uh, Jane's mother was also named Phyllis. So her mom was Phyllis and she was named Phyllis. Uh, She married Isaac Manning, was her first husband. Isaac was probably a shoemaker, or at least he was making part of his living as a shoemaker. And he is the one who in 1822 or 1823 purchased that property on on Old Highway and built the house there. He, um, I've got some of his shopping lists. I know that he, was rather fond of rum and he really liked smoking tobacco. Uh, he, he liked music. He bought himself a little, it's, it's called it, I call it a jaw harp. This is kind of, there is another name for it, but it's very uncomfortable sounding. So we'll go with the jaw harp. It's, it's that little instrument that it just kind of produces one tone, kind of like a sproing, sproing, sproing noise. Um, and you can sing along with that. It's great for having dances. So she may have had, you know, a rather lively, um, you know, youth uh, up on uh, Old Highway there. And she goes to um, her mother, uh, has uh, quite a number of children. It's around five or six that we know about that that survived to adulthood. And um, Isaac, her husband, dies probably around the 1825 or 1826 mark. And she remarries to Cato Treadwell, who was a Revolutionary War veteran, um, who we saw um, his pension application at the beginning of the talk. So she remarries to him. And then they are all caught up in Jane's new faith. They all get baptized and they head out to Nauvoo, Illinois. Um, They do not accompany Jane on the final leg of the journey, which happens a year or two later uh, after the assassination of Joseph Smith. Uh, the, the group under Brigham Young's leadership moves out to Utah to found Salt Lake City. Jane goes, the rest of her family does not go. They resettle um, throughout the Midwest. Uh, a brother ends up in Canada. Somebody I think ends up in Michigan, but her mother now calling herself Eliza Mead is in Iowa, uh, Kalkuk, Iowa, I think is where she was. Let's see, what else have we got? Oh, 14 new messages. Oh dear, this is a lot. Uh, Yes, Jane was, um, I believe Jane Manning, James was part of another congregation before converting to Mormonism. Uh, How many integrated congregations at the time? Uh, Yes, there were a lot of integrated congregations. I know that the Norwalk Congregational Church, uh, that one was, you know, integrated. It's not fully, it's one of these things where you're separate but equal, right? You're not really equal. You have separate pews. Sometimes um, in some churches in Connecticut, we know there was sort of a balcony and that's where the black folk were allowed to be. In other situations, there was a designated pew. Uh, sometimes these rules were broken and a particular you know, white family or white individual brought a black person and had them sit in their pew with them. And that caused a bit of a you know uproar. We don't have a history of that in Wilton that's known, but that happened at various places in Connecticut. So they were uh, generally allowed in, but a separation was maintained. Um, And Jane was indeed part of a different congregation. She joined the Congregational Church in New Canaan when she was 14. And her comment on that in her autobiographical statements is that she wasn't satisfied. She felt like there was something more And she found that in those sermons from Charles Wesley Wandell. And let's see here. Uh, Any descendants of enslaved black uh, persons still in Wilton? Not that I know of, not that I know of. Uh, The last one uh, 
that we know of who lived in the area. His name was John Tonkin, and he would have been born very early 1800s. He died in 1893. He is buried in Wilton. We're not 100% sure which cemetery, um, but he is buried in Wilton. And um, he had, he probably had children. There was a younger generation of Tonkins uh, who show up in the census records in the 1880s. Uh, in 1870s, but we don't know what becomes of them. Uh, if they survived, they either evaded the census takers or they changed their last name and we can't find them anymore. Um, his sister, Jack, uh, John's sister was Eunice Belden, who I mentioned at the beginning. She evaded the census every single time. She is not on a single census, but she shows up. We know about her because she shows up in, um, in accounting ledgers kept by various general stores. So, and also we have her in the list produced by our 19th century Wilton historians who were descended from the Abbott family. She came out of, of enslaved situations with the Beldons and um, they were close, relatively close neighbors of the Abbots and the Tonkin family in general seems to have been a big personality type family and well known in the area. So um, Eunice was remembered by this 19th century fellow. Um, actually, Holda, uh, Holda Hill Road used to be named um, Black Nancy Lane and Nancy was another of the Tonkin uh, family. So that kind of goes towards, and Jack is remembered in many, many anecdotes. So I, I suspect they had big personalities. Uh, let's see here. What was involved in the abolition, ab abolition movement in this area? Well, we have some lovely things. We have explosions, we have bombings. Um, so the Georgetown Baptist Church actually uh, suffered a couple, well, in one bombing <laughs> attempt and a successful bombing attempt because they were having an abolitionist meeting there and uh, hosting abolitionists who were giving talks. Uh, the thing to remember about early abolitionism, um, not just in Connecticut, but uh, throughout much of New England is that um, it was a pretty complex movement and the motivations and beliefs of the people were equally complex. So a lot of the abolitionists, particularly in the early 1800s, they were, their beliefs were in combination with something called colonialism. So they wanted to abolish slavery, but they also wanted to get rid of black people. They wanted the blacks to move to Africa to colonize, you know, uh, over there. Uh, so the solution to the problem, the problem that was slavery was also a problem of black folk, according to many of these abolitionists. Uh, but we do have um, some interesting history of that in this area. We do have uh, both in Wilton and in Ridgefield, for instance, uh, that has recently been, been talked about by Jack Sanders. Uh, Uncle Ned's Mountain, we have uh, people who were involved in the Underground Railroad and, and trying to materially assist escaped slaves getting to freedom. So we do have a local history of that here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that one I can't answer, so we're not even going to go to that one. Uh-oh, coming to the tail. Did any of my research spill over into Weston? Um, not much. I haven't gone much into Weston yet, but we do have one of the families that the Lamberts employed right around 1805. Uh, they went both by Fitch and Cuff. They had Weston origins and um, they had been enslaved in Weston by Deacon Andrews, I believe. And when they became free, which happened gradually because a lot of the children were coming under the purview of that 1784 law where they become free at 25. So early 1800s, they're becoming free and they moved to Wilton. And this is a large family of about nine people. They moved to Wilton, they work for the Lambert family. There's lots and lots of little notes from the Betts store where um, Cuff Fitch, Drake Cuff, uh, Hilpa Fitch, where all of these people are running errands for the Lambert family. And this is something very interesting about the Lamberts uh, and about some of these 
things where I'm talking about Charles being almost but not quite family, uh, where we talk about Charles maybe sleeping in the same bed as Elizabeth and Julia. These things are kind of hinting at certainly late 19th century, but I wonder also about earlier 19th century kind of gossip surrounding the Lambert family, that maybe they were too close to the to black folk and too close to the black people that they employed. And that maybe there was some criticism there amongst the, uh, the rest of the Wilton community. Certainly, if in the early 1800s, you lived in Wilton and you were uncomfortable with there being too many black folk around, the family that you could look at, the two families you could look at and blame for it far and away were the Beldens and the Lamberts. After that, the Abbots. But what made the Lamberts a bit different is that they were bringing in black folk from outside. The Beldens, it was all the Tonkins, quote, our blacks. The Abbots, it was all the Manning family. Once again, ours, we're used to them. They grew up here. We kind of trained them, right? They're not unknown. They're our responsibility. But the Lamberts are bringing in people from outside and they are gonna be less trusted. The fact that they're moving around, anybody moving from town to town is immediately gonna be regarded with suspicion. Why are you leaving? Why do you lack good connections that would keep you rooted in place? Anyone who's itinerant is a problem, or viewed as a problem. Anyone who's moving town is viewed with some at least initial suspicion. So the Lamberts are, are bringing in people from outside, employing them for a few years, then moving on to the next family. And that's probably also an index um, finding slave records in the Lambert family is difficult because the generations of Lamberts who we are almost certain had large numbers of slaves and in some cases we know they had slaves from other documentation, they didn't leave wills. If they left wills, they have not been recorded. They're just not in the probate records. So we can't go through with the Lamberts and find out you know, all this information that we can for some of the other families. And we're left with you know, hints and one of those hints is the number of black people, free blacks that they employed in the early 1800s can be taken as an approximate index to how many slaves they may have been considering necessary to their lifestyle in an earlier period. So they probably had several slaves at any given time would be my guess, but I cannot prove it. Um, some Wilton buildings must have been built by slaves. Do we know which ones? No, we do not. But we do know a few places where they either lived or were closely associated with. The buildings that definitely would have been built by formerly enslaved folk or descendants thereof are John Dulliman's residence, which was out at about 54 um, Old Mill Road. Uh, I think that's the right road, not Old Mill, no. Um, I can't remember the name of the road. It's close to Weston. It's the one that goes by the, the old mill that then became a, a restaurant, that road. So it's out on that road. And he built a house there, but that house is no longer standing. And John very likely was once enslaved, but not in Wilton, uh, possibly in New York. Then we have the house that was at uh, 96 Old Highway, built by Ian uh, Isaac Manning, no longer standing. But uh, we do have houses where we know uh, that enslaved folk or formerly enslaved folk lived. And in particular, we've got the households of the enslavers. So the Lambert house is one. The Ebenezer Abbott house is another. And um, the Lambert house I don't have concerns for because the Historical Society has it. But a house like um, the Ebenezer Abbott house, and, and I'll give the location, it's 51 Shadow Lane. I have concerns for that one because it's got to be awkward uh, feeling to realize that you're living in a house that had slaves in it. And what do you do with that information? How do you manage it? Because we don't, as a community, we do not want to lose that house. That house is a very important reminder. It should stay here. But at the same time, how do you make it possible for someone to live in it comfortably? And I think that's something that as an institution, the Historical Society um, should think about 
how to help preserve a place like 51 Shadow Lane because it may need help. It may need help if it becomes a little widely known uh, that this is a place that was associated with slavery. Um, a, a happier location is 232 Danbury Road. I think I'm getting the address right. And 232 Danbury Road was sold to uh, John C. Wally, formerly Lazarus, enslaved by Nathan uh, Abbott, the son of Ebenezer Abbott. And uh, he purchased that in about, I think it was around 1840, 1830s or 1840, and he owned it for about a decade. And when he sold it, he sold it for about four times as much as he bought it for. So he turned a, a tidy profit on that house. That house was sold to him by Daniel Betts. And uh, it was adjacent to Daniel Betts's property as well. That house still stands. It has had uh, quite a few modifications. It has had additions. Uh, the original entrance is probably not the original entrance. Uh, it doesn't have its original chimney, so it is much changed, but that was John C. Wally's household, and it most re recently sold for, you know, several million dollars or something like that, so it has, it has gone, he lived in a nice neighborhood, let's put it that way, and close to St. Matthew's. Uh, John C. Wally actually worked at St. Matthew's as well. He rang the bell, he did some sweeping. Uh, Charles King worked um, in association with, um, with, with St. Matthew's occasionally, and so did another uh, another um, Black family, uh, Morris and Susan Brown. Morris did some grave digging there. Um, he did uh, some other work at St. Matthew's, so there was a lot of connection there with St. Matthew's. Ooh. Julie, is this a good time yes. to stop? Yeah, or? yeah, we can stop. I can, I can keep going, but we can stop too. Everybody's, everybody's now wondering where the, uh, the Spruce Bank is in the questions. <laughs> Yes. Right. <laughs> we don't have the answer, right? We do not have the answer, no. Okay. Um, Julie, well, I wanted to thank Julie um, for an incredible presentation that has just such an astonishing depth of research and um, uh, Julie's ability to just pull together just what appear to be thousands of details from scattered, scattered, obscure records is, is really a testament to her skill as a researcher for which we thank her very much. Um, we're hoping to um, utilize this incredible research some more, as I mentioned before in a uh, video that we're working on that will focus a bit more on um, families in Walton. So we'll say goodbye for now, and I'm sure we're going to be looking for more presentations from Julie at some time in the future. Uh, we delve more into this incredibly important topic. So thank you, Julie, and thank you all for coming today. And visit the Wilton Historical Society. We have lots going on, lots of great information about Wilton. History is here in Wilton, and it's at the Wilton Historical Society. Thank you all so much for coming. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone, bye.